So we're going to be in Mark chapter 14, verses 12 through 26. I just simply entitled this the Passover, the Passover, and we'll look at it in three parts. Uh, Jesus sends two disciples in verses 12 through 16. Jesus speaks of the betrayer in verses 17 through 21. Jesus and communion in verses 22 through 26. So last week we actually were dealing with uh, two different, or actually three different groups of people. We had the religious that were trying to, uh, to kill uh, Jesus and arrest him. We had the betrayer, and then we had Mary, uh, the worshiper. And uh, one of the things that I love about Mary is that she, she gave everything that she had uh, to worship the Lord. It was an alabaster flask that was worth a, a year's salary. In Mark 14, 8, it says that she has done what she could. She has done what she could. And one of the things I just love about that is, like, I probably should have asked you the question at the end of that service is, what group do you fall into? Are you the religious that love religion? Are you, are you someone who's pulling people away from Christ? Or are you the worshiper? And, and my, my prayer would be is that we would all be the worshiper, but that we would do that in our daily lives. Because even though we're not saved by works, we're saved by grace, faith is an action. It's an action. And, and worship needs to be active. Worship to the Lord should be a priority that should be in each one of our hearts daily. And so are you one of the, the critical or the worshiper? That was the, the thing from last week. And as we dive into this scripture today, one of the things that you're going to notice is, where's the washing of the feet? It's not covered in Mark's, okay? And so what are we studying? We're studying the book of Mark. And so that's why we're... we're you're probably going, man, I, I, we kind of skipped something, didn't we? But that's how Mark, Mark presented it. And uh, we'll kind of dive into it a little bit next week because we have to talk about Peter. And so we'll, we'll deal with the, uh, the pre-conversation that happens when Peter is like, no, you're not washing my feet. And, uh, and, and it just deals with some other things uh, of his pride and stuff that's there. So uh, let's go ahead and dive into our first point. Jesus sends two disciples in verses 12 through 16. And on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him. Now, again, the, the feast of unleavened bread and Passover were one feast that lasted some, somewhere around eight days. And you can find, uh, we went over the Passover last week in Exodus 12, uh, verses 7 through 14. Again, it's where uh, the plague was going to uh, affect Egypt and the Pharaoh, the firstborn of all beasts and, and children, uh, all firstborn. Uh, and um, in order for that uh, plague to pass you, you had to sacrifice the lamb and put the blood on the doorpost. And so if it, it tells you in, in verse uh, Exodus, in Exodus 12, verse 13, it says, The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood... I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you, you, uh, you to destroy you. When I strike the land of Egypt, this day shall be for you a memorial, and you shall keep it as the feast of, uh, to the Lord throughout your generations as a statue forever. Uh, you shall keep it as, it as a feast. And so that's why they're doing the Passover now. And then we have the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, which is a few verses down in, in verse uh, 18. It says, in the first month of the 14th day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month at evening. For seven days, no leaven is to be found in your houses. If anyone eats what is leaven, that person will be cut off from the congregation of Israel. Whether he is a sojourner or native of the land, you shall eat nothing leavened in all your dwelling places. You shall eat unleavened bread. Now, there's two reasons why they talked about this. One, they had to leave quickly. Leaven is the yeast that actually causes the bread to rise. And, and he was telling them, you cannot have leaven. And, and also, leaven and, is a portrayal of sin. 
it's it's an image of sin when we allow sin into our life it 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 rises it it's working secretly we don't see what it's doing right but eventually it spreads and pollutes and rises and that's what the 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 representation of leaven is in in the bible and so the feast of unleavened bread and the passover about eight eight days and um they, they practiced the Passover first. And it was normally starting, and this will be important as we get into the crucifixion, around sundown of 6.30 p.m. And they ate until midnight. It's a, now, that may sound like a, a, a long time, especially for us, uh, but for French cultures or Italian cultures, they have courses of meals. And the meals can go on for hours. And, and so, um, and this would all happened on Nisan 14. During Passover, there were some 250,000 lambs that were slain. So they would have slain around 250,000 lambs. And the city would have been bursting at the seams. It would have been close to a million people in the city. And so... It's important for us just to kind of get that as we dive into this to understand that Jesus is going to celebrate the Passover and yet he is the Passover lamb that will be slain. And so it says, And when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, Where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And it's very interesting because he doesn't tell them all the information. It's almost like a cloak and dagger type thing. He doesn't give them everything. And you wonder if that's because of Judas. You know, in Judas, uh, uh, in John chapter 12, verse 6, it says he, he said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help the people, help himself to what was put into it. And we know last week that Judas went to uh, the, the chief priests and the scribes to betray Jesus for money and so that may be the reason why Jesus didn't give all the information because he doesn't want Judas to know because it's not time yet uh, Jesus is in control and it's not time for him to go to the cross yet and it's a reminder to us and it's something that that you know it's hard because we do have people that are almost like Judas in our life um, that that will manipulate or try to get information out of you and 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 I had had that reminded to me and and it's true there are people that do that and I need to be careful of that myself and all because look that the, the devil is always going to put a Judas around you you need to be careful it wants to pull you away, wants to, to get you further away from, from God, or wants you to trip up and stumble and sin. And, and it was just a reminder to me, you know, uh, that that's something I need to be aware of myself. And uh, somebody who, who may be acting as a friend but is trying to get gossip or trying to bring information out of you is wrong. And so the location is very important. So the where is important because they're going to end up in the city. And now Jesus, because he is a Jewish male, he is required to be at Passover. Right? And some people would say, well, why is he going into the city? Why is he, if, he's, if they're trying to kill him, trying to arrest him, why is he heading back into the city? Well, that's because God's in control. And it's not his time yet. But we know that the Jewish males had to go and, and uh, be at the feast. In Deuteronomy 16.16, 16, it says, Three times a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord your God at the place that he will choose, at the feast of the unleavened bread, at the feast of the weeks, and at the feast of, the, of booths. They shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. So they had to bring a sacrifice. And this is going to be Jesus' final meal here uh, during this, this period, his last supper. And it's not the last supper like you've seen in the pictures. I don't know how many of y'all had, like, Jesus at a table and everybody around. That's not what that is. 
it, it's when we get into this, you'll see that they're reclining. It's a, it's a completely different than the picture that that uh, that has become very popular. That's that's wrong theology, actually. But yet Jesus is the Passover Lamb. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, it says, Cleanse out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Like, get rid of the sin. So you can be a new lump without it. As you, re as you really are unleavened. Because it's like you've given your heart to Christ, you're unleavened. Our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Jesus in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, it says, And all who dwell on the earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of the life of the Lamb who was slain. Jesus. And then we know in John chapter 1, verse 29, it says, The next day he saw Jesus, John the Baptist, coming toward him. And he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus, the Lamb of God. And I love it. He sends two disciples. In verse 13, it says, And he sent two of his disciples. So, one of the things that, uh, that we know is that Jesus gave direction. Okay? So, if you ever become a leader, part of being a leader is you need to learn when it's time to give correction, when it's time to give wisdom, when it's time to, to, to just, man, I need to be praying. When it's time to be loving and gentle and share truth. There's a balance to it. And I love it because they, they followed the direction. But, but we see this time and time again where Jesus does give direction. And he does send out two. And we know the two that he sends out in Luke chapter 22 verse 8 was Peter and John. That was the two he sent out. And you probably remember back in Mark chapter 11, verses uh, 1 and 2. I won't read all of it, but he had sent two out to go do what? Get the colt for the triumphal entry. Same thing. And same thing where he tells him, hey, go tell the, the villager that the Lord has need of it. He's going to kind of do the same thing here. And he says, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. That's in the second half of 13. Go into the city and a Mary carrying a jar will meet you. Follow him. Don't know the guy's name. The city has over a million people in it. And you're going to go look for a person carrying a jar. Now, something very important here, and this, you know, it's, it is what it is. During the time, men would carry animal skin pouches for water. Men did not carry water jugs. Or, or jars of, of water. That was the woman's job. That's what they did during that culture. It would be like a man carrying a purse. It stands out. But now we have men carrying purses and wearing dresses. So it's just. But it would stand out. And so looking for a man carrying a jar. Is going to stand out in this city. Bustling of over a million people in it. As they're all trying to get to Passover. They know what to look for. And so they're going to look for this man. And I love it because Jesus gives very specifics. Look for the man carrying a jar. He'll be there. Go find the colt. The Lord has need of it. Where do they find the colt's there? The man with the jar is there. Let me tell you something, if you, if you want to know direction for your life, you need to be in, in devotion with God. You need to actually be seeking His direction for your life. His will. Because He'll give you specifics. And He does that through His Word, He does it through prayer. You know, he does it through that small, quiet time that you have of meditation of his word. He'll do that through uh, a godly person in your life. They'll share something. It's something that you need to hear. But it's, it's a reminder to us that God wants to be specific in your life as well. 
In verse 14, it says, And whenever he enters, says to the master of the house, the teacher says, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with the disciples? I want you to catch that. The teacher. Not a teacher. Not what teacher. The teacher. The teacher of teachers. Jesus. There is no other. Even the, the, the scribes and the Pharisees called him teacher. Back in Mark chapter 12, verse 32, when they were discussing what the greatest commandment is, what did he say? And, and he said, and the scribes said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is the one and that there is no one, no other besides him. You are right, teacher. He tells them, where is my guest house and where I may eat the Passover, where my disciples and so Jesus didn't disclose the name or the location because he didn't want Judas to hear. Because it wasn't time for him to be taken up yet. Verse 15, it says, And he will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. And there prepared for us. And the disciples set out and went to the city and found it just as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover. This is very important. The disciples were given direction by Jesus. And what did the disciples do? They obeyed it. They obeyed it. And that's important for us to remember as well. As obedience is what God expects from us. If you're his child, he expects obedience. He will deal with your disobedience. Don't think that, it, that you're just getting away with it. Because he'll deal with it. But the Lord instructs, and, and we are to, be, to obey obedi immediately. Peter and John obeyed the Lord. And that's for us. Like, if you, if you want to see uh, you want to fully understand where you're being led, then be obedient. Like, you, you need to be obedient to God. And sometimes he's not going to give you the whole picture. I love this because they had to go find the man with the jar. And then once they found the man with the jar, he was going to take them to the location. They didn't even know the name of the person that was letting them in the upper room. But they were obedient. And when we take steps of faith, sometimes what happens is in your obedience, God is not going to give you everything at one time. Sometimes you have to take a step of faith. And be obedient. And that can be hard for people. When we decided to finally leave to plant the church, we had no clue where we were going. I just was like, okay, Joe, it's time for me to, to start church planting classes. I, I'm ready to go. That was step one. We ended up in, in uh, Victoria, Texas, Fredericksburg, Hondo, um, Cal Allen. I'm trying to think. And, and, and every time, I can remember when we came back from Cal Allen, just like, I don't even want to talk about it no more. I was so frustrated because I was like, I don't know what we're doing. I, I've taken this step of faith. I don't know where we're going. COVID was kicking in at the time and we didn't have any there wasn't any place open nobody would allow us to meet and then one saturday i think Teresa had went with her sister uh for breakfast and i was like you know what i think i'm gonna take a drive out to hondo and go see about the hotel and I, i'll be honest i didn't want to go because i was like i'm not even sure what i'm doing next and you start doubting your your call like, is this really what I was supposed to be doing? I remember driving to Hondo praying, and I saw a building, a beautiful building, right in between Casterville and Hondo, right in the middle. Called the guy and tried to find out how much the rent was for the building, just, just for giggles and grins, because I knew I had a friend of mine that was in Casterville that was looking for a place. And just within that moment, everything kicked in, and it was like, okay, 
here we go again. Next step of faith. Call. We, we called Hondo, and then somebody recommended Market Media, and the next thing we know, we ended up at Marcus's place. And here we are in Divine. Now, if God would have told me Divine right off the bat, would I have gone? Probably not. If he would have told me these are the steps you're going to take, that's where you have to trust God. That's where people struggle because they become disobedient. They, become, they, they, they get frustrated and they just go their own direction. I can't wait on the Lord. I got to do this. It's like God is trying to guide you through this life and guide you through your day. Guide your business. Guide your marriage. Guide your family. And it's like all he's asking you to do is take the step of faith and be obedient to him. And answer the call. And that's what these disciples did. And I love that because at the end of the day, God will always bless obedience. Always. And he has. I mean, I, me and Teresa, when we started it, we figured it'd just be me and her for a year. And if nothing happened, we'd, we'd be done. But God has blessed it. Not because anything we did. All we did was step out in faith. We were obedient. Because this is his church. In his direction. And, and, and the same thing for you is it, you're his child. And he wants to direct you. And he's just asking you to, hey, take that step of faith. Do what you're being called to do. We look at our second point. Jesus speaks of the betrayer. In verse 17, and when evening, when it was evening, he came with the twelve. So now this is very important because we're, we're going into Nisan 15. Remember, a Jewish day begins at around 6.30 the next day. So this is important. And, and we'll get into that as we get closer to the crucifixion and the resurrection. And so they had to be completed before midnight, the meal. And so um, one of the things that we do know is that on Thursday after sundown, and this is very important, just a timeline, just to help you out because this will be important as we get closer to the, the crucifixion and the re resurrection. On Thursday after sundown, we have the Last Supper, we have the, the prayer in the garden, and we have the betrayal and the arrest. And then after midnight, right, we have the, the uh, Jesus is taken into custody on Thursday, Friday morning, early Friday morning. And then he goes on trial. Then you have Peter's denial. Then on Friday, early morning, it continues. You have Jesus sent to Pilate. Uh, the hearing before Pilate, Jesus sent to Herod, and then he's returned to Pilate. And then late morning, noon, Jesus is nailed to the cross. Mid-afternoon, Jesus dies. And before sundown, near sundown, Jesus is buried. Now, all of that will be very important as we put together the timeline for the crucifixion and the resurrection. It's important because people argue that stuff, and we need to make sure we understand it. And it says in verse 18, And as they were reclining at the table and eating, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. So again, remember, every time you see the word truly, that's amen. So he's telling you, hey, you need to pay attention to this. Everybody that's listening, he's saying, amen, I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. Now, Jesus knew this all the way because he's fully God, fully man, back in John chapter 6, verse 64. It says, but there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning of uh, who those who were who did not believe and those who it was who be would betray him. So we find out through that scripture that, that Jesus knew that that, that Judas was going to betray him and that Jesus, Judas was an unbeliever. Judas didn't believe. He believed that Jesus would be the, the king of Rome. He believed that Jesus would uh, overthrow Rome and be, become powerful and, and hopefully be, through that 
because I'm a disciple, I'm going to become rich and powerful too. But now he's realizing that that wasn't Jesus. At the moment, that alabaster flask, it was at that moment that he's like, this is not the guy that I thought he was. And, and we're, we're going to see where Satan actually enters him. And Satan can't enter, a, uh, you can't have a demonic possession of a believer. And so let's, let's go a little bit further in verse uh, 19. It says, they begin to be sorrowful and say to him, uh, him one after another, is it I? Is it I? Lord, is it I? And that word sorrowful is actually grieved in the Greek. They were greatly aff afflicted with sorrow. They were actually searching their heart and mind. Like, is it me? Could I betray him? In Jeremiah 17, 9, it says, The heart is deceitfully above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? God. God can understand it. God knows what's going on in your heart and your mind. I love what Warren Worsby said. He goes, if you want to know what's on our hearts, or, or, or if you want to know what our hearts are like, we must read the Word and let the Spirit teach us. If you want to know what our hearts are like, we must read the Word and let the Spirit teach us. Meaning that when we read God's Word, it reveals things in our hearts. Sometimes things that we need to repent of. Verse 20, he said to them, It is one of the twelve who is dipping bread into the dish with me. It is one of the twelve who is dipping bread, uh, dipping bread into the dish with me. In John 13, 13, 18, it says, I'm not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture must be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. So when I read this, the first thing I thought about, if anybody's ever been to Tony Carabas, they do, they, on the, when you come eat, man, they bring you fresh bread, which is really good. And, um, and, but they have herbs on the table and they pour olive oil in it, right? And then everybody's doing what? They're dipping their bread and in the plate and so this means that that judas must have been sitting near jesus as they're reclining at the table now reclining means that they were actually either sitting or kind of laying down and eating because that's what they do in the middle east um so judas would have been right there and this, this is again in Psalm 41, 9. This is prophecy being fulfilled. It says, even my close friend in whom I trusted, who, I, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. And Jesus quotes that, that, that psalm. In verse 21, it says, For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 25, Judas, who would betray him, answered. This is the parallel in the synoptic gospel. It says, is it I, Rabbi? And he said to him, you have said so. Like he, he's still calling him Rabbi. He's still playing the deceit. He's still lying all the way up until this point. Acting as if he's in shock. In John 13, 27 through 30, it says this. Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan had entered him. And Jesus said to him, what are you doing? What you're going to do, do quickly. No one at the table knew what he had said to him. Some thought he, that because Jesus had the money bag, Jesus was telling him to buy what we need for the feast. Or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out and it was night. So Judas is going to inform the 
chief scribes and the and the um, chief priests and the scribes to arrest Jesus. He's gone. Satan entered him. Demonic possession, really. And and Satan can only enter into somebody who's a non-believer. And, and people can be demonically possessed, so don't think that it can't happen. It happens. I mean, we have, we have Satanists in the White House now. I think the, the new guy that they picked for the, that, to lead the, the monkeypox thing, he's, he's a Satanist. It's evil. Just pure evil. Now, I want you to get something here. Judas is gone, and now communion begins. Right? So our last point here is Jesus and communion. And this is not going to read like we normally do with communion or like it does in the other synoptic gospels. But remember, Mark is writing this to a Roman audience. Okay? And so as we get into it, let's look at verse 22. So we look at our last point here. And as they were eating, he took bread, and after blessing, he broke it. And he gave it to them, and he said, Take this, is, take, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. So Jesus is sharing the, the Lord's Supper with them. And it's, it's illustrated through the elements of the bread and the wine. The bread that Jesus broke and he shared a picture of sacrifice and he would offer himself as, as an atoning sacrifice of sin in order for us to be redeemed of our sin and provide us salvation. And the verse that y'all are used to, and I was trying my best to do this on Communion Sunday, but it just didn't work out. Uh, but... 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23 through 26 is the verses that y'all are used to hearing every month. And that is, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this. As often as you drink it in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So we practice communion. Uh, the, the Lord's Supper is, is a powerful time of spiritual intimacy. That's why we do it. We do it once a month. It's a, it's a demonstration of, of us having unity as a church. And a common meal with the Savior. And it's, it's a special time for us to be able to have communion because it goes beyond just our normal relationship because we're actually breaking bread and drinking of the cup and in, remem in remembrance of what He did on the cross for us. That you can actually be forgiven of your sin. I talked about it last week. It's like, at the end of the day, my brother-in-law, man, I was telling you, it's amazing because God forgave both of us. He's a believer as well. And it's just amazing because it, when you think about the Lord's Supper, and, and it, it is a time of spiritual intimacy. And so when we take communion together, you're not to be worried about what your, the neighbor's doing. You're to be focused on worshiping the Lord and actually spending time with God and being in remembrance of that time that you raised your hand and you said, I'm yours. I repent of my sins. And then you start doing business with God. Lord, this month I've been so prideful. And I need to ask for forgiveness of that. Like you start dealing with your stuff. Or you got stuff going on with your family. Lord, you know, I, I need prayer for my, my child. You know, you, you're just, you're having that spiritual intimacy with God. For what His Son did for us. 
There's so many shadows of, of the Passover and Exodus that were fulfilled in, in Christ. If you want to just go to Exodus chapter 12, I'll run through them real quick for you. In Exodus chapter 12 and verses 1 and 2, it deals with the Passover marked a new year and a new beginning. We're told in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 that you are a new creation in Christ. The old has passed away. Behold, the new things have come. In Exodus 12, 5, it talks about how the, the lamb was to have no blemish. Right? Spotless, perfect. Had to be inspected. Christ was closely inspected as well. The priest inspected him in Luke chapter 20, verses 1 through 26. The Sadducees inspected him in Luke chapter 20, verse 27 through 38. The scribes inspected him in Luke chapter 20, verses 39. Pilate inspected him. Herod inspected him. Caiaphas inspected him. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, it says they couldn't find no fault for he was a lamb unblemished and spotless. In Exodus chapter 12, 6, the whole community of God, the people were required to participate in the sacrifice. When we receive and believe in Christ, it's required for us to participate in God's kingdom. In Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 26. In Exodus 12, 7, the blood of the Lamb was applied to the two doorposts on the lintel of the house in which to eat. The Lord would pass over the door in verses 23. The doors that were marked with blood. Christ shed His blood to deliver sinners. One needs to be covered by the blood to be delivered from condemnation. In Romans chapter 3, 25. Romans chapter 5, 9. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. It's the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And we just read that verse to you. So when we talk about the blood, we talk about you being covered by the blood. That freaks people out. It's because the, the Lamb of God that, that was slain, Jesus Christ on the cross, that you're covered. When you give your life to Christ, you're covered by the blood of Christ. So that way when God sees you, he sees his son. Because you're covered by the blood. In Exodus 12, 14, the Passover was to be kept. It was a permanent memorial. The Lord's Supper communion is supposed to be something that we do in remembrance of Christ. We should be doing it every month. In Exodus 12, 46, God commanded Israel not to break any bone of the lamb. And this is a unique piece of scripture here because when you think about it, the Roman soldiers came to break Jesus' legs, but he was already dead. So no bones were broken in John chapter 19, verses 32 through 33. So the lamb had no broken bones. Every little detail, I've told y'all, when you read the Word of God, it's like every little detail proves the Word of God. And he finally says in verse 25, Truly I say to you, again, amen, I will not drink again of the fruit of the wine, uh, vine until that day when I drink it, in, drink it new in the kingdom of God. So he stopped at that point and didn't have the cup. But he's also speaking here about the millennial kingdom. For those of y'all that have chosen to follow Jesus Christ, you'll be here when this happens. Think about that just for a second. You'll be in the kingdom of God when this happens. In Isaiah 25, 6, it says, On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine, well refined. And so the Messiah will be, uh, you know, as we look at the millennial kingdom, he'll reign over Israel and over all nations of the world. And you'll be part of that feast. And so when Jesus closed, he, he, he passed on that fourth cup, the final cup, because he had to take the cup of wrath.
And he says, I'll have that, I'll have that cup at the millennial kingdom. And he says, it's not going to happen until, uh, I love that, and until, until, and that means that it's, it's emphasizing that the moment in time, the rest of the statement becomes true. Until the kingdom of God. Like, this is going to happen. Like, I'm not going to have that drink or the fruit of the wine and until the day when I drink it in the new kingdom of God. And that's a glorious truth. That there will be the kingdom of God, the coming of the kingdom of God. In verse 26, finally, as we close up, it says, And when they had sung, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So, normally when they did Passover, Psalms 113 through 118 would be sung. Psalms 113 through 118. I love Psalm 46, uh, 47, 6. It says, Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing, pra sing praises to our King, sing praises. We know that Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 16, verse 25, it says about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to him. Instead of calling and complaining to God, they start singing. Can I tell you, man, that's one of the I struggle with that at times. Even as your pastor. It's easy to complain. Right? It's easy. But will we sing hymns? Will we worship in those tough times? I mean, Paul and Silas are in jail. They had been beaten. This is the midnight hour and they start singing. They start having worship in the jail. And that's how we should be as well. I love this. They're, they're, they're just finished the Passover dinner, and what are they doing? They're singing hymns. And one of the psalms that it talks about is Psalm 118. Now I want to read you these verses, and we'll close out here. I don't know why this this week that I don't as I was studying this 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 psalm really stuck out to me, and it may be something that somebody else needs as well. But can you imagine Jesus actually singing this? In Psalm one eighteen verse five, it says, "Out of my distress, I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free." The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. All the nations surround me. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me, surrounded me on every side. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me like bees. They went out like a fire among thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I was pushed hard so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. This is the last meal. Uh, the Last Supper is, is uh, before the crucifixion. And they would have been singing hymns. And 
worshiping God. And for me, I love that verse 14, the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. Be obedient. Do what God's called you to do. If he's telling you to go look for somebody with a jar of water, then go look for the person with a jar of water. Take the step of faith and say, Lord, I'm going to do it. The Holy Spirit, remember we talked about the power of the Holy Spirit will guide and direct you. Y'all need to be connected to it. But look, at, at the end of the day, if you're struggling with anything, man, Psalms 113 through 118 is what they used to sing during Passover. And to think that your Savior sung that. Jesus. And he had been at other Passovers. And yet he sung that. I don't know why it stood out to me because that for me I, I think it's it's we see things that are going on in our world and, and the chaos that's surrounding us and whether it's Memphis or just sadness that, that people are become so deprived. Uh, they've got such a depraved mind. Uh, but we need to be trusting in God and we need to we need not to trust in man. We need to remember that the Lord is our refuge. And that he's our strength and our song. And we can't forget that.